Okay, and this is a good group. It looks like it's pretty informal, so I think uh, we'll all appreciate that. I'd like to introduce uh, Pamako Nomura. She's an Asian American writer, lives in Tacoma, Washington. So thank you for coming down for us. Um, she's written a lot, reviews, interviews, um, two books that should be of interest to everyone. The first one is a book on Rosa Franklin, A Life in Healthcare, Public Services and Social Justice. It's about the first African-American woman to be elected to the Washington State Senate. And her second book she co-authored, it's a graphic novel called We Hereby Refuse Japanese American Re Resistance to Wartime Incarceration. And I think that one will be published soon, is that correct? May, yes. <laughs> okay, great. And uh, she's going to talk about her writing and creative process and uh, probably open to any questions. I know we have design students here. We have library students. I'm not sure if we've got any English majors um, joining us, but this should be of interest to everyone. So I, do, I believe you have a uh, PowerPoint to share. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. I do. So you can take over now. OK, great. <laughs> Before I bring that up, hi everybody. My name is Tamiko Nimura and I'm joining you from Tacoma, Washington. Um, and I'm just really thrilled to be here. I'm speaking to you from the land of the Coast Salish people and the Puyallup tribe. Um, I used to teach and I love questions and I love talking to people. Um, so please do feel free to put them in the chat and to talk. Oh my gosh, there's a Tacoma connection already. How exciting. Um, hey, Lori. <laughs> um, so um, please, uh, please feel free. I might not be able to see all of the questions in the chat, especially as I'm talking. So um, I'm going to count on, um, on the moderators here to just keep me honest and answering your questions. Um, I am going to then go ahead and pull up um, a little presentation that I have for you. Um, I hope that this will be interesting for everybody. It's um, really a sort of writing creative path uh, talk and just some things that I've learned about um, being a freelance writer and about um, how my roots and family history play into that. So let me go ahead and pull that up. Um, and I always get a little panicked. So just let me know if I'm actually still there and you can see my PowerPoint. It always, <laughs> it always uh, kind of is disconcerting. So I'll be, I'll be here in a second. Okay, so there's the share. Whoops, there we go. Okay, this is my PowerPoint. Just somebody unmute, please, and let me know that you can see it. I'm not seeing it yet. You're not seeing it yet, okay. Ah, okay, share. Start. And how about now? Now we see it. We yeah, see it. Great. See it. All right, yeah. thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, so yes, I just wanted to call, uh, talk, pretty informally today about my path as a creative writer. Um, I write mostly creative nonfiction, but um, I've written across enough genres that I hope it'll be interesting for a lot of people. Um, so I'm, I'm calling this From Roots to Roots, <laughs> a nonlinear writing life. Um, I'm a freelance writer, public historian, arts writer, a community journalist, um, essayist, memoirist, biographer, oral historian, um, and now a co-author of a graphic novel that's coming out. And I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. So um, for the first part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about my path and then focus um, in the second part of the talk on the two major books or major projects that I've worked on. And then I hope to leave time for questions after that. Um, I'll be talking in some detail about the graphic novel, so hopefully the design students will have a chance to uh, take a peek into that process. All right, here we go. So to start out, 
I always go back to my family roots. Um, on the right hand side, there's a picture of me and my little sister, Teruko, who's a visual artist. My dad, who's got his hands on my shoulders, um, named Taku, who is Japanese American, um, born here in the United States. And then the, uh, my mother is hiding her face. She's dressed uh, in, in the, um, the uh, yukata on. Um, my mom, Helen, there is Filipina American. So I'm half Japanese American, half Filipina American. Um, my dad married pretty late for his generation. So that means that I'm third generation here in the United States. Um, my grandparents, who are in the uh, center of the left hand photo, um, emigrated from Japan. Um, and they had six kids. Um, some of the uh, people in the picture are um, an uncle by marriage and a baby cousin. Um, and um, one of, let's see, oh yes, but the other six siblings then, uh, my dad's in the top middle there. Um, those are all, um, they had a large family. <laughs> but um, I grew up with a sense of being um, really of two cultures, being both Japanese American and Filipina American because my name is Japanese um, and I've, and my mom did not, and my mom came over when she was about 10 from the Philippines. Um, I grew up knowing a lot more about uh, Japanese American culture and history, um, but I go back to these roots quite often. Um, they nourish me, they um, give me a sense of self and a, self, a, a sense of service as well. Um, my dad and his family, um, almost everybody in the left-hand picture, were incarcerated at Tule Lake in northern Northern California during World War II. Um, and that one, once I kind of learned about that history and found out more about it and how much people don't know about it, I found myself really wanting to explore that st story further and to um, tell that story as much as I could. So that part has really, really never quite left me. All right. Um, this next slide here, um, I want to tell you a story about the uh, left hand building there at UC Berkeley, where I went to college. Um, and this story about um, a project that I was working on, it, again, is another route right another place where i um, have taken a lot of my inspiration for a lot of my writing so when i was in college at berkeley um, i was an english major and i was going to um i did a a, a a thesis project when i was a senior and i was walking up the stairs that you see in that uh picture on the left and I was gonna go see my thesis advisor and I was writing about poetry and about short stories by third generation Japanese American women. Now, these are authors that I didn't really read as an English major. Um, I didn't take, I only took one class in Asian American studies to my regret when I was at Berkeley. And so they were not authors that I had read a ton of, but um, I felt that for my thesis, I really wanted to focus on things that felt relevant to my community and to my history and my family. So, um, and people like me. <laughs> so I focused on two authors, Janice Minikitani and Ruth Sasaki. And I went to go see my thesis advisor because I had come up with a, I come up against a problem. The problem was that in writing about the power of silence and silence that had been kept for generations about Japanese American wartime incarceration, it actually made very little sense without some historical context. And that sounds kind of strange, but as an English major, you're not really trained to include history as an undergraduate, that is, um, to weave in other things that might affect um, what's, what you're talking about. And so when I talked to my thesis advisor, I said, what am I gonna do? I have to include history in this paper. <laughs> and my advisor, who was a man of color, said to me, you were right. He said, I'll I will never forget this. He said, 
you are absolutely right. You have to include some history. But just remember, not everybody in this department would let you do it. Not everybody in this department would let you do it. And when I heard that, I was shocked. I was appalled. I was so upset and angry. Um, I can't, I couldn't believe that there was this silence, not only from within my community that didn't talk about the camps, there was a silence in the curriculum, which hadn't really taught very much about the camps. And now from my discipline in English, there could have been this silence, which would yet again suppress this important history. And so knowing that um, I really was um, motivated to study more about Asian American literature and multicultural American literature. And I went on to graduate school and got a degree, a um, couple of degrees in English, still focusing on the histories and the stories of people of color. And most often you have to include historical context when you're studying these literatures. So fast forward to um, a blog. Um, I had uh, a backstory for my blog. I know nobody reads them anymore, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I, um, I had a bad breakup with academia. After graduate school, I taught for a while and was denied tenure, which means that the university basically didn't think that um, I was uh, worthy enough to stay. And so after that, I really kind of floundered for a while. I'd spent about 10 to 12 years um, on this as a possible career, and I didn't know what to do. So one of the things was I applied for lots of jobs. Um, I read a lot. I floundered a lot, a lot. And I started a blog. <laughs> um, now, you know, in 2021, I know blogs are not really something that people read very much that or they keep up on it very much. Um, but here's, let me tell you, here's what a blog helped me do. Um, it gave me lessons in frequent low stakes writing <laughs> because I didn't think that very many people were going to read the blog very often. Maybe I would write something and put it up on social media, Facebook or whatever. My mom would probably be reading it, but I didn't count on a lot of readers. <laughs> um, I did not have the kinds of money or metrics that would go into a huge readership, but frequent low stakes writing was a huge part of building my writing practice. Um, it just meant that I could, you know, get there, face a task, a blank screen, a blank page and do the thing. And that was incredibly helpful. Sometimes when you're in the writing life and you can, you can think, oh, I don't know, what am I gonna do? How do I face this? I've got writer's block. Um, but a blog was something that I was just doing for me and it was practice. Uh, practice was so important and it helped me build a portfolio eventually. Um, I could point to a particular blog post that I thought, oh, that's actually a pretty good piece of writing. Um, it helped me refine my writing skills. Um, and I think maybe most importantly, it helped me find my writing voice. Doing enough of those posts, <laughs> um, again, low stakes, pretty fre frequent. I did, I think at least a couple a week, um, if not more. And after all of that, I found that blogging would, was, was a useful practice for me. And it's not something that I keep up as well now, unfortunately, but I think just blogging got me into the writing habit. Um, habit is really important, I think, when you're a creative. So from there, um, I published this piece um, for on, my, on my blog. Um, at, you can see it at the uh, bottom of this picture. And it's and I wrote a piece called Why Ichiro's Departure Makes This Nikkei Girl Sad. <laughs> um, Ichiro, I'm talking about Ichiro Suzuki, who was a Japanese baseball player from Japan he played for Seattle, made uh, baseball incredibly popular here yet again. Um, and then he left for the Yankees. Uh, Nikkei, by the way, refers to anyone who is a Japanese migrant or their descendants. So I wrote a piece that was just, I was so sad that Ichiro had left Seattle. <laughs> uh, my husband and I watched baseball 
Um, and there was something about watching him play and watching all these fans chant his name, right? Ichiro, Ichiro, that I had never quite felt before in Seattle, which when I moved here um, felt like a somewhat white city. I felt out of place uh, racially. And so Ichiro really transformed how Seattle felt for me. Um, from there, that one piece, um, a friend of my cousin's saw that piece and she said, hey, would you like to write for this site um, called Discover Nikkei? And I said, yeah, I would love that. And Discover Nikkei is actually a web project of the Japanese American National Museum down in LA. If you haven't been, um, I highly recommend it. From there, I started to do lots of arts writing, lots of arts interviews. The International Examiner is a, an Asian American newspaper here in Seattle. Um, I started writing book reviews and interviews. Um, my editor was a huge believer in sending people to learn things on the job. <laughs> and so he would just say, go write a profile of this artist. I want you to meet them and just talk about their practice and their, you know, what they're working on. Um, and I'm a really shy person. So it was hard for me to go out and make the, all of those connections. But um, in doing that, I found that I got to meet really interesting people and I got to support um, the people, the voices, the events, the places, the causes that I really wanted to support. And this is really some of the power of community ethnic media, right? A lot of the mainstream will not cover to, the, to this extent or this depth, um, the stories that are being told every day in ethnic communities. So the International Examiner was a place where I could do that. Um, the same goes for the North American Post. Um, after a while, um, the North American Post asked if um, they could reprint pieces of mine. Um, Discover Nikkei um, at the bottom there and the North American Post, they now have an agreement where they, um, uh, that they publish whatever, um, that whatever I write. Um, and Discovery UK after a while had said, oh, you know, would you like to write an ongoing series for us? Just has to be about being Nikkei, has to be about being Japanese and somehow in the Northwest. So I took that beat seriously, like, okay, I better go and find places and people and causes and events in the Pacific Northwest about being Japanese American. And in that sense, I got to build some community and I got to um, create some relationships and that has all been incredibly rewarding. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit now. So that's some of the arts writing community events that I've been able to do. Um, that's one branch of what I write. Um, another, um, oh yes. So just a little um, kind of a snap, little bit of snapshots of the people that I've been able to meet. So um, middle and going clock, top middle going clockwise. Um, Alan Say is a Japanese American uh, children's book illustrator uh, to the right is um, Renee Sims, who's an African-American novelist, essayist. Uh, bottom middle is uh, Sayari Rafay, who is a non-binary artist here in Tacoma who does murals. And then uh, back to the left there is um, my dear friend, Anita Ali, who um, does a lot of work around being Muslim and Khmer. Um, here in the United States. And all of these folks are pretty much, except for the middle top there, a lot of these folks are from Tacoma. Um, a lot of them do really fascinating work but are often under the radar. So um, now, there we go. I will get to talk to you a little bit about my work in public history. Um, remember at the beginning of the talk, I talked I talked about my family's history with incarceration and um, how that really affected me. And when I moved to Tacoma here in Washington, we're about 35 miles south of Seattle. When I moved to Tacoma, um, I was really sad and missing a Japanese American community. There's a very tiny one um, and the Buddhist temple here, but um, there is not a Japantown per se uh, as there is in Seattle or little Tokyo in, in Los Angeles um, or in San Jose, San Francisco. Um, and I and I and I missed that, and I was and I lived here for ten years before I discovered this map on the left hand side. Um, it was a 
the map was in a history of uh, Japanese Americans in Tacoma and in Pierce County, our county. And I found this map and it just blew my mind. <laughs> um, it showed me how a map could really um, document some important history. Um, you can't see it very well, but if you look closely at the names on the map, a lot of the names on the map are Japanese. The map is um, hand-drawn and it is um, a map from around 1920s to 1930s of downtown Tacoma. Um, and all those Japanese names, as well as that history book I was reading, told me that Tacoma had once had a Japan town. Again, I'd lived here for 10 years without discovering any of this because about one out of seven uh, Japanese Americans came back to Tacoma after the war. And so I looked at all these names. I looked at, you know, Uwajimaya. Uwajimaya um, is a really big pan Asian American supermarket in Seattle, but it actually started here in Tacoma. And I just thought how different my life would be if I'd had a large Japanese pan Asian um, grocery store to go to in downtown Tacoma. But also if all those folks had still been there, right? Um, what would have happened if the incarceration had not taken place? Um, there were close to 180 Japanese owned businesses in Tacoma um, at the peak of the Japanese American population. And almost all of the city's population were evicted from their homes in that downtown core um, in May of 1942. Mm -hmm. And so this map of historic Japantown in Tacoma really showed me how a map can break your heart. I really thought about just how much we had lost and how much uh, never returned. And I would talk to people about Tacoma's Japantown and most people that I talked to had no idea that we'd had one. <laughs> and they would say, what, we had a Japantown? I said, yeah, we, we actually did, but, but I, I can show you. <laughs> Here's a map and there are pictures. Um, and it just kind of showed me how much uh, the infrastructure had disappeared for Japanese Americans. Um, here, it showed me um, just how much folks had lost all those businesses, the hotels, the temples, the communities. Um, and because the University of Washington here in Tacoma had basically bought up a lot of the land around the um, Tacoma Buddhist temple, I realized mm -hmm. that if we weren't careful as a city, we could possibly um, erase just about everything that we had of Tacoma's Japantown. What we do have now are two buildings left standing from that time period. Um, there we have the, uh, the Methodist Church, which is now an art center with the university. And then we have the temple. Mm -hmm. um, and the temple is the only thing that we have that is still serving a Japanese American community here. So mm -hmm. I did a lot of research. I did a lot of writing. <laughs> Um, and on, at the picture on the right hand side, um, I was um, doing research on these, uh, on these folks, these are Nisei folks, second generation Japanese Americans, um, who all went to the same Japanese language school here in Tacoma. Um, and so a lot of these stories were less told. A lot of folks had been scattered all over the area. As I said, most did not come back to Tacoma. And so um, I just really sort of fell in, into some kind of uh, obsession, right? With trying to make sure that we knew that Tacoma had this deep connection to wartime incarceration and that um, at least it, in some of its roots, Tacoma has been a Japanese American city. And as a mom with two young daughters, um, to have that sense of deeper connection to the history of a city uh, felt powerful to me. Mm -hmm. um, from there, <laughs> I did some work um, on sort of short biography, um, short history, um, encyclopedia essays about his Tacoma's Japantown. I started to lead some walking tours um, of Tacoma's historic Japantown with my friend, uh, Michael Sullivan, who's a colleague mm -hmm. and a historian. Um, and in leading hundreds of people around uh, downtown Tacoma, 
um, I found that it was very powerful for people to find out the power of a place um, for them to stand in a particular intersection on a corner in front of a building, um, to walk into some uh, one of those two buildings and to feel the kind of history that the place had had. So um, those walking tours and that history as educational tools have been very important for me as well in my work. Um, so um, that's kind of a nutshell of my path here. Um, the second part of what I wanted to talk to you about are the two major books that I've worked on in the last few years. Um, and so they're the covers. Um, the uh, top one there is uh, Senator Rosa Franklin. Um, and I wrote a biography and an oral history about her. And then I have a second book coming out um, in May. It's a co-written graphic novel. All right, um, let's see. So um, I don't even read biographies very often, confession. Um, but um, I was chosen by Senator Franklin to write this book. <laughs> And when she asked me, even though I had no experience in writing a long biography, um, when she asked me, I could not say no. <laughs> um, the two pictures on the right hand side there are from an event. Um, it's called Women's Intergenerational Living Legacy Organization. And it's about um, basically different women from the Tacoma community um, sharing um, without notes, a 10 minute story about their life and what's inspired them. So the bottom picture on the right is a baby picture of me. And then I'm second from the left there um, as we're um, on this panel of, of women sharing our stories. Um, the picture above that one on the right, so top right, um, I love this picture because it was actually after the event. Um, the picture is of a young um, Japanese American girl who asked to have her picture with me. But right behind her, there's a woman in gray and she has gray hair and she is talking to me and that's Senator Franklin. Um, the story that I told at Willow was about um, how I came to um, learned about the story of Tacoma's Japantown and how, how I became interested in sharing that story with a wider variety of folks. And um, Senator Franklin was at this event. She heard my story and she, I think, liked what she heard. So she came up to me afterwards. You can see us having this conversation. And she said, I really like your story. Will you send me your resume? And after I knew who she was, I said, um, I, I would love to send you my resume. <laughs> um, by then, you know, I'd had you know a fair amount of uh, writing, um, you know, clips and and you know things, links, portfolio things under my belt. Um, and um, you know, when someone like her asks you for your resume, you say yes. So I, I sent it to her and I said, um, "Could I ask why you want my resume?" And she said, "Oh, well, the Washington State Legislature um, it has this oral history program." And that was all she said. And I thought, okay, well, great. Um, <laughs> she said, okay, I would just like to forward your, you know, your name and your resume to the Washington State Senate. And I said, wow, okay, that would be great. And I, um, you know, sent her my resume, sent it to the person she told me to send it to. And he, and my contact at the, at the Senate, who was a secretary of the Senate said to me, Ah, yes, Senator Franklin told me to expect you. And she's too modest to say this, but we have this oral history program where we feature important legislators of our state who have served in the past. And she is the next candidate for uh, this program. Mm -hmm. And it was that moment when I realized that Senator Franklin was choosing me <laughs> or asking me to be her biographer and oral historian. And when I realized that she's the first person of color at all to be featured in this program, um, which I believe makes me the first woman of color to be writing any of these books. Um, I thought, okay, this is really important. Um, and after a meeting at Starbucks in which she talked to me about her life for an hour and a half on election day, 2018, um, 
I was a little bit in love, honestly. She's such a charming, amazing person, um, incredibly um, accomplished, but also incredibly modest. And so she spent 42 years as a nurse and then, um, and had three kids. Um, her husband is in the military. And after her career as a nurse, she decided to go serve in the legislature. Um, and she served our state for 20 years <laughs> after that. So this incredibly long, amazing life. So there's the healthcare, the public service and the social justice. And so I spent a lot of time um, you know, taking down her history, interviewing people, um, coming through several hundred newspaper articles with the help of a research assistant. Um, and the whole process took about 10 months. And that was, I think, a really fast timeline for all of that. But um, she was, I think she was pleased with the result. Um, she's now 94 and still with us here in Tacoma. So that's my first book. Um, Meanwhile, <laughs> back in 2017, I was hired to co-write a graphic novel um, about resistance to Japanese American wartime incarceration. Um, the Wing Luke Asian Museum here in Seattle is a pan-Asian American museum, and it has, um, re it has received some money from the National Park Service to do a series of graphic novels about Japanese American history. The first one was about Japanese American veterans. This one is about Japanese American resistance. And then the third one, which comes out in the fall is about allies who helped Japanese Americans, I think particularly during the war. So on the left, you have um, the cover or at least part of the cover here. Um, those who have studied Japanese American incarceration know that this is a kind of a, a play on that famous poster, which was on telephone poles posted all over the place, um, which were instructions to people of persons of Japanese ancestry, um, detailing the conditions of their eviction and forced removal. And part of what we did here, as you can see, is to use that same font, um, but to try and reclaim a bit of that and say, this is actually a story about resistance and about refusal. Um, it was a creative team, um, four of us. So um, myself, um, you can see on the top left, or top right, uh, myself, uh, Matt Sasaki is one of the artists. He's right next to me. Um, and Frank Abe, who is the gentleman in the middle. Um, he's my co-writer and a documentarian and a journalist. And then the far right is Rossi Shikawa. So we had two artists and two writers. Um, and... Um, the two of us, the writers, had never written a graphic novel. <laughs> um, however, so we had a lot to learn. However, um, the two artists had done different kinds of visual storytelling, um, illustrations, and, uh, and uh, storytelling through comics. Um, the bottom right corner, or yeah, the bottom right corner photo there is just a little photo of um, Tule Lake, again, where my family was incarcerated. So, you know, you can see this history popping up yet again. Um, I was really interested in telling the story of resistance, partly because one of my uncles was a relatively famous resistor. Um, and as I found out during the research for this book, my grandfather was also a, res a resistor from within Tule Lake. So I'll talk more about that family um, history in just a second. Um, so um, this is the sort of full cover for the graphic novel. You can see that central image there again that we hear by refuse. Um, and then there are flaps, right? Which actually tell, uh, which fold in. Um, on the right um, side of the uh, image there, it talks about, um, the title and then three voices, three acts of defiance, one mass injustice. Um, and so we decided to focus on three main storylines, but also to try and weave in as much of the history of resistance to the incarceration as we could. Um, a lot of what has happened, I think, to um, the story of Japanese American incarceration is that um, folks still tend to 
picture kind of smiling, happy, um, or at least kind of quiet um, victims, right? Who, uh, who didn't protest, didn't complain, just went along and you know, did what they had to do and to prove their loyalty to the United States. Um, and there are a few problems with this narrative, right? It um, allows people to, I think, see Japanese Americans as uh, more victims, as people to pity, oh, what a tragedy. Um, and also really papers over, glosses over the acts of resistance, which did happen um, for the incarceration. Um, there are several stories that people might know something about um, if we were in a classroom together, I'd have you raise your hands and uh, have you tell me if you did know of any of those names. There are three men who took their cases to the Supreme Court, um, Minyasui, Gon Hirabayashi, and Fred Korematsu. Um, but there was a fourth Japanese American who took her case to the Supreme Court and won, and her name is Mitsie Endo. And there are three bubbles on the left-hand side of the image um, with the faces of our three characters. So Endo is the uh, young woman with the hat at the bottom of the image there. And we tell her story about how she was a uh, Japanese American, fired from her job uh, working for the state of California along with all other Japanese American employees because of their suspected loyalty to Japan. Um, now, almost all of them, right, had grown up here, had in the States, um, considered themselves quite uh, definitively American um, and knew their constitutional rights. So it was a huge shock to them when so many of them had their constitutional rights violated. Um, so Endo's story, though, um, I think is, is, has been uh, overlooked rather silent for a lot of reasons. Um, partly, I do think, because she's a woman. Um, so that's one of the stories that we decided to tell. Um, moving up from uh, Endo's story, um, there is the story of Jim Akutsu. Um, he's the top bubble in the middle of the image there. Um, the top bubble, <laughs> um, and he's from Seattle, and he um, resisted the draft, arguing that um, Japanese Americans uh, you needed to have their citizenship changed to eligible status again before they could actually agree to serve in the military. And then there is the young man on the left of the far left of the image, that's the middle bubble, um, Hiroshi Kashiwagi, who um, also resisted by talking about the, um, the quote loyalty oath that Japanese Americans were um, uh, forced to sign while in camp if they wanted to leave. Um, I'm kind of simplifying a lot of this history very quickly because I want to get to questions. But um, my uncle um, said no to two really um, fraught questions. And the first one was, will you agree to serve, um, the, the, will you agree to serve in the United States Army on combat duty wherever ordered? And the second question, which was highly controversial, was, will you forswear your loyalty to the emperor of Japan? Now, again, almost all um, second generation Japanese Americans, right, did not have loyalty to Japan. They had grown up here and considered America their country. Um, and so to forswear <laughs> your loyalty to the Japanese emperor, might mean that you had loyalty to the Japanese emperor in, a, in the first place. And so it was a bit of a trick question. Um, the question about serving on in the military, um, by that point, um, a lot of um, this had gone on for, camp had, been the, camp had been there for years. And a lot of them were very, a lot of folks were really upset. Like, how can you ask us to serve in the military when you've, put, when you've placed us here, <laughs> denying us the rights of citizenship? So um, for his decision though, my uncle was um, ostracized, um, set, set apart from the Japanese American community um, because the larger narrative that people wanted to paint was Japanese Americans are loyal. Therefore they will serve in the military. They will go without complaints. They will prove their, citizen, their loyalty um, through these kinds of acts. Um, but my uncle had 
scored really well on his eighth grade constitutional test. <laughs> um, and he was 19 by the time this was happening and he knew his rights very well. So um, I really wanted to try and tell his story um, and share it with a larger community if I could. Um, for the design folks, uh, we're gonna transition a little bit into some of the stuff behind what it was like to script the uh, graphic novel. Um, this picture here is uh, Mitsuye Endo, who I mentioned from the last uh, slide. Um, this is when we found out that uh, she actually won her case at the Supreme Court. They, um, her, her lawyer argued that you cannot hold loyal American citizens indefinitely. Uh, which sounds kind of straightforward, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, the government delayed her case for a while, appealed it for a while, sent it back and forth. Um, and because she refused the government's plea bargain um, to say, um, I will drop my case if uh, you let me go, um, she, refused to, to the, she refused their offer and said, no, I'm staying here because this bears on the ability of all Japanese Americans to go back to the, to the West Coast. Um, so here's her, uh, her scene where she's uh, in camp and decides that she's won. And I just want to take you a bit behind how far back she could, when this goes. So um, there was a secondary source, a law journal article that I had <laughs> um, where I found out a little bit more. This is not published till 2011. So it was kind of amazing that, um, you know, it emerged so late in the game. Um, and my favorite part of that, the uh, quote at the top there is that we were so happy that we actually danced around the room. <laughs> I just loved this idea so much. And I thought we have to include this moment um, of these, you know, two Japanese American women in their barrack, right? Um, being so elated at this news that um, Japanese Americans would be good, would go back to the West Coast that I had to, we had to put, we had to put it in. So that was that secondary source um, from the archives, we were able to request um, the um, letters between Endo and her lawyer, James Purcell. So this is the, a facsimile of the telegram that uh, she sent to him when she found out the news um, in December, <laughs> December 19, 1944. Um, she sent it to San Francisco to um, her lawyer's office. I'm extremely joyous of results. I appreciate very much your long effort in restoring our rights. Um, so I just loved seeing that piece of, um, you know, a, a little bit of her voice and a little bit about what that moment must have been like. Um, from there, um, I don't expect you to read this whole thing, but it was, um, a we went to a story arc and created character sketches. Um, what kind of person was Endo? We didn't know very much about her. We did lots of research. My co-author flew out to meet her family, but she was a very private person. Um, we did a story arc, uh, talks about when they dance around the barrack, um, telegrams back, and then they, um, the war relocation authority announced that the camps would close. So we did a story arc. Um, from there, we did a little bit about panels. All right, here are the panels. Here's the full page. Here's a tall panel. Here's a short panel. Tried that out, gave it to um, one of the artists, Ross Ishikawa. Um, we had some reference photos, uh, a lot of reference photos actually for the artists. Um, because my co-author is a journalist, accuracy is everything. And so um, we tried to make sure that the, uh, the barracks were the right kinds of barracks, um, that the post office actually did have that color and that particular sign. So reference photos, right? And along with directions for the panels about how that would go. Um, and from there, <laughs> um, our, uh, our artist went to work and he knew that because this was an important moment, he said he wanted to give us a lot of time, right? A lot of ways to um, have people take in the importance of the moment. Um, from there though, he discovered that, you know, there are things that little details that wouldn't necessarily work. Um, Topaz Barracks did not have stairs going in. Um, at least the post office did not. Um, the Western Union telegram had to look a little different, um, but you'll see the reference photos um, appearing yet again here on the right-hand side. Um, and then we took a look at the telegram, the dancing around the barrack, 
um, what would you, what she what would she have been wearing? Um, how can we make sure that all of this uh, comes together? So um, that's a bit about this. Just a, you know, a little bit of the process behind every scene <laughs> for the graphic novel. It was a lot of research, a lot of work, a lot of collaboration. Um, so I um, went a little longer than I hoped. So I hope you're all still there. And, and, and I look forward to questions. Um, just a couple of things that I've learned. Um, if you want to be a writer, you need to plan to read and write a lot. Um, and writing to build a practice and a portfolio, you should write to meet deadlines. You should find your voice, refine skills, and make connections. Um, I am happy to answer questions about anything I've talked about so far, but also things like arts, like uh, the freelance life, uh, arts writing, biography writing, or histories. Um, and of course, the graphic novel itself, which comes out in May. You can pre-order it from bookshop.org. Um, so anyway, um, thank you for letting me uh, talk to you for so long and to share some of my story. And I look forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. <laughs> that was so much longer than I thought. I'm so sorry. But <laughs> oh, no, no. We're, we're good. We're good. We're learning a lot. Um, so I've got some questions here. Oh, great. Uh, let's see. What is your writing process for writing a comic script or story outline? What's some writing advice that you can give? I think you gave some of that, but maybe you could I did give that. some of that, but I definitely uh, could give a little more. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is just to kind of know the kind of graphic novel you want to write and to be able to read a fair number of graphic novels to know the kind of story you want to tell. Um, how much silence you want and how much drawings would, would, would do and then how much text. Um, for ours, again, because historical accuracy was just about everything, we did a lot of research for reference photos um, to make sure that the artists do things accurately. Okay. Um, and then there are books like Understanding Comics um, which talk about how to um, actually go about creating graphic novels and the visual language and storytelling techniques that graphic novelists and comic artists use. And then Sylvia, you asked if uh, Japantown is still in Tacoma, I think. So there's not a Japantown anymore. There are two buildings and then a number of locations where um, we take people when they come and, and see it. Um, I should mention that um, there's a, a, a phone app and, and like a smartphone application that my husband created um, that has a map of Japantown, like what I used to show you, and then pictures, uh, like historic photos of what it used to be. Um, if you look up Tacoma, Japantown walking tour, I think um, it's free and it's for iPhone or Android. Um, so uh, people can still go see, um, there's a self-guided tour, right, for the, uh, the app that I mentioned, and there's lots of it's a lot more writing about it than there used to be. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, John, you said love those sketches. Can you comment mm -hmm. since you're one of our graphics faculty and <laughs> No, I just yeah, no, I just saw those sketches and it's yeah. <laughs> I, I love to see like conceptual things before, you know, the final art is done. Before the final, and, yeah. Yeah. It, it's just uh um, but I had a, uh, <clears throat> oh, just to comment also on, uh, actually, Little Tokyo is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, really struggling as well yeah. with, uh, yeah. you know, I, I work for my father's store back in the, I guess you would say probably from the 70s to the 80s. And that was right on First Street, right in the heart of mm -hmm. Little Tokyo. And it was very, you know, just a, a bustling town. Uh, you know, so many restaurants and stores and, and now you walk around there and, you know, it's, it's getting very slim and yeah, San Francisco's Japan town is suffering similarly from what I've yeah. heard. But I was going to ask you about the, um, you know, I've always wanted to, uh, I have three granddaughters and, mm -hmm. uh, what age group would you say the youngest age group for your new book coming out would be? Uh, I'd say sixth grade is about as low as I'd be willing to go. Uh -huh. um, but really, it's, you know, sixth grade and up, right? So college kids could be reading this book, right? Um, if, you know, I know uh, my, my son. Grown and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, grownups can be reading this book, right? I think, you know, it's really, it's meant as an educational tool. We actually have a curriculum online um, that goes oh, okay. with 
almost every single page of the book. Uh -huh. um, so uh, there, there's that component to it, certainly. But uh, really, it's, you know, for everybody from sixth grade up. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, definitely going to be on the on the list. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, okay, Hannah, you asked, uh, and this is for Tomiko, did your parents and or family talk about mm. the Japanese incarceration with you and from what age? Age, it's hard to say. I feel like it's something that I've known for all, for a long time. Um, my um, my dad came um, to talk about uh, his camp experience when I was in fifth grade. Um, so he came to talk to my class. Um, but I feel like I knew even before that. I'd written, I, I'd read books, um, Yoshiko Uchida's books for kids um, about Japanese American families and camp. And my family had talked about it um, off and on at gatherings. And so I don't feel like there was a huge silence around it in my family. Um, and my dad has this, had this um, unpublished book about his uh, time in, uh, in Tule Lake where his family was. So um, my next book is uh, working with that unpublished manuscript. So I feel like I knew a fair amount um, from pretty young, from pretty young. Uh, that uh, answered one of the questions. What are some of your future plans in writing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, there are lots of things. Um, I, I should just mention really quickly that uh, I have a, um, a history exhibit um, um, text uh, that's coming up at the um, BART station in San Bruno, California, um, just south of San Francisco. Um, BART is the Bay Area Rapid Transit. Um, thing and there and it's the site of um, uh, it's one of the sites of Japanese American incarceration. It used to be a racetrack, then it became a um, incarceration center, and then after that it became a racetrack again, and then a shopping mall, and now it's a shopping mall plus um, a BART station. And so um, I'm part of this team that's uh, basically presenting the history um, on one of the station walls. So that's really exciting. And then we asked, um, let's see, how do you deal with writer's block? Oh, <laughs> um, writer's block comes less for me now because I have a lot of deadlines. So that's actually one answer. External deadlines are a really good way to get me to work. <laughs> um, if I make promises to somebody else, that is one really big way to, uh, to get over that. Um, low stakes writing is another, um, and I have, I even have this right here. So I have my, my composition notebook. Um, I have lots of these and writing by hand does a lot. Just doing little like kind of bubble clouds is another, um, and really just to, um, find something that makes me happy to read it or happy to write it. Um, that will also um, that will also do it. Most of the time, though, it's just I've got a deadline to meet. I should just go meet, get that work done. Great. And then, how long does it take you to write a book from start to finish? Oh, it depends on the book. <laughs> um, so the biography oral history took a ton of research, a ton of uh, putting a bunch of different kinds of data together. Um, but that one was only ten months, and so that was one of the very few projects that I took on during that time. Um, and then the graphic novel we were hired in, uh, 2017, um, oh no, 20, early 2018 and it's taken us this long to finish it. But I think it's partly because it was four of us rather than two of us or just one of us. Um, and it really just depends on the project. I think this book that I've been working on my third book, it's a memoir, um, that one's taken me almost eight years, um, to really figure out how to, how to put it together. And then um, what was the reason the Japanese Americans did not return to Tacoma? Only one in seven. Okay, so a couple of reasons. The first one is that Japanese Americans in Washington state, um, as in a lot of other places in the country, they weren't allowed to own land or um, really property. Um, some actually wanted to, um, you know, go places where um, they had they had settled after the war, like Chicago um, or the Midwest or Colorado. Um, they had gone there first after the war and really just didn't want to pull up roots again and come back to Tacoma. Um, and so, you know, if, if you don't have, you know, things to come back to, right, 
um, it makes it a lot harder to want to return. Um, there was a fair amount of uh, anti-Japanese sentiment in Tacoma. There was a, remember, Pearl Harbor League, um, which committed, we think, uh, an arson, an, an act of arson um, on one of the hotels owned by a Japanese man. Um, the mayor of Tacoma was actually very, um, you know, in favor of Japanese Americans. He had spoken out against incarceration, but um, to have almost no infrastructure to return to, right, makes a difference. Okay. Um, um, oh, Lori, you said your, your grandparents didn't come. Oh, so your grandpa wanted to farm. Where did your grandpa end up farming? Reedley, California. Oh, Reedley. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he really wanted to go farm. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, Central Valley. <laughs> that's, so. that's, that's rural California. So. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, let's see. Oh, I see a question about dialogue. Interesting dialogue. Um, I don't know if I have a really good answer to that question, except that I read a lot, right? And I write a lot. And I think just um, having, you know, those two things of, you know, of listening to how people actually talk um, makes a difference, but I'm not a great fiction writer, right? So I don't know that, I don't know if that's what that, that question's from a fiction writing perspective. And then uh, Gloria asked, what happened to the land that was owned before uh, they were incarcerated? Well, they wouldn't have owned it, right? So that was one thing. Um, Washington State had a really uh, very anti-Japanese uh, senator <laughs> named Albert Johnson who prevented them from owning land. Um, different farms though that, that people rented or that um, they had bought in the names of their kids. Sometimes um, sometimes those, got, those went to caretakers, sometimes um, they were sold at, you know, pennies to the dollar, <laughs> right? Um, almost nothing. Um, so that is another reason why they wouldn't have been able to come back, right? They didn't have the farms that they'd built up. They didn't have the businesses, nurseries, houses, anything like that. Okay. I have a, a quick question, Tamiko. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, as far as another art, art question. <laughs> uh, I, I love the the style of illustration in oh, the book, yeah. and is yeah. that is that something that the is the artist's style normally, or was that a yes, it is his special style. And there's okay, yeah. yeah, and there are two different artists, right? So we have two really different um, illust illustration styles as well. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so I didn't get to show you that piece, but. Um, yeah, so Matt Sasaki, the other artist, does a much more expressionistic style, um, whereas Ross, the artist whose work you saw, um, works in that more realistic um, style. But um, together, I think, and, and to balance that out, was a whole discussion for years <laughs> about yeah. how to make that work. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, but we assigned them different storylines, which was part of it that helped. Um, the art director for the press also made some really great uh, choices about the borders for a page. Um, so for one, for Endo's, Mitsuya Endo's story, right, the, you know, the pages had this color border. Um, for the um, Hiroshi Kashiwagi, my uncle's story, um, his... Um, his uh, illustrations are mostly in like kind of charcoal, black and white uh, with splashes of uh -huh. color. <laughs> um, and then when we had the government or lawyers or JCL, uh, Japanese American Citizens League talking, um, their panels were all in black and white. So that was another way to distinguish <laughs> uh -huh. all the different locations and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, was, it was a task, I'll tell you yeah. that. <laughs> I really like it. Yeah, it's just there's a simplicity to it that is just, you know, I mean, I, I, I bet that um, those people look exactly like that, too. You know, just a few lines and yeah, just a few lines. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, Ross is really gifted that way. Um, and we gave my um, we gave a lot of photos of my uncle to uh, Matt, the, the artist for his storyline. Um, but um, yeah, it was <laughs> it was definitely something. Yeah. But they, they, I think they look really nice together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
are you up for a few more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, let's see. How, is, how do you come to the decisions when you're collaborating with writing a book? Do you assign roles? Hannah, can you expand upon that a little bit? You can unmute yourself, Hannah, you're okay. Uh, I was just wondering how collaborating with books go, um, whether, you know, is there a main writer? Or are you just two co-writers? How do you, because I know when you're writing, you have your own voice, you have your own style. So how is that to mix? um in sorry I, uh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um i i've done several kinds of collaboration now um and this this one was definitely different than others um but um i think the way that we approached it was really to try and divide and conquer a bit so um i wrote some of the basic storylines um for um, Endo and for um, Kashiwagi, for my uncle, um, and but you know I'm not uh, I'm not a script writer, a play writer, a visual storyteller <laughs> necessarily. Um, whereas my co-writer is a documentarian, and so he'd had some experience with that kind of combining the visual storytelling with the text, so uh, or with dialogue even. And so um, there were lots of layers that he added um, and. The artist had also asked us to give us th give thoughts about impaneling things, like how do you break it apart into scenes and then panels on the page and so on. Um, so that part then became um, kind of a back and forth conversation with the artist. So we divided and conquered, um, but definitely trickier, I will say, when we were hired not as a team, like we were hired separately, right? Um, we didn't apply as a team. And so we hadn't had an experience working together before. And that's just a, a harder situation, I think, especially when you're collaborating on an artistic level. Because yeah, as you say, like the voices, right? The styles, like I have a very different style than my co-writer. So um, yeah, it was, it was definitely um, a trickier collaboration, but lots of respect and trust, I think is really important for collaboration. Um, how many hours a day do you dedicate to writing? <laughs> not enough <laughs> um probably honestly probably about two to three and but that's like you know after the emails have been written and all the other kinds of administrative things um applications maybe that i'll be, I'll be sending or coordinating um, publicity events for the graphic novel all of those things and to actually write um if i'm lucky i'll get two to three hours um in in a day um i'm a mom I have uh, kids who are doing online schooling um, and now partly in-person schooling. Um, and so a good part of um, what I do is also running the, um, you know, kind of making sure that they're supported, they feel supported and that, that, that some of the daily operations of the house still go on. Um, when they were in in-person school though, I was getting more done than that, than two hours. <laughs> and then Laurie, are you here? Is Laurie still here? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm still sorry. here. Uh, Obon, yes, Obon. Um, okay. So the yukata was actually, um, let's see, a present from our relatives in Japan um, when we went and visited them. So, um, but we, but my mom did use it for Obon, and Obon is something that we have gone through to uh, a lot. For folks who are not knowing what we're talking about, Obon is a <laughs> uh, Buddhist festival. <laughs> Um, and it's kind of like our version of Day dead. of the Dead. Yeah, yeah. our version of Day of the Dead. And it's lots of food and dancing and celebration <laughs> to welcome the spirits back of our ancestors. Um, so yes, uh, all those questions. Oh yes, Mas Masumoto is really cool. I really like him and his daughter as well. Mas, um, yeah, yeah. Nikiko, who's a Yonsei, really great. I love, I love the style of um, his writing. It's like very Yeah, poetic. it's really beautiful. Yeah, it's really beautiful. It's very lyrical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really great. Oh, you can hear my dog. Sorry. <laughs> He's probably very excited. So, uh, any other questions that we might have? You know, you're welcome to unmute yourself too. Um, Hannah, you want to, you're just making a statement uh, or what is your question? Do your parents, oh, did your parents encourage you to research more? Was there, was part of your question about the incarceration? Um, yeah, I think my, you know, my, my dad died when I was 10. And so I think part of my, uh, 
you know, search and reaching for that history um, was also an, um, another attempt, right, to be closer to him and to his life. Um, but yeah, my mom has always been super supportive of me and my sister. She was that um, somewhat rare Asian parent that encouraged us to go for the arts. So my sister's a visual artist and I'm a writer um, and with the full support of, of, of our parents. And Elijah, you're asking where uh, can you view the recording of this lecture? I'll be posting it on my Canvas site, Maria. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, hold on, uh, I'm gonna leave. I gotta leave now. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow or uh, you. next week. Sorry, see you Connor. Monday. Bye. <laughs> see you Monday. Bye. Bye, bye, Connor. Bye. Uh, so uh, I'll be posting it on Canvas, Marie. Are you doing the same? Where'd you yes. go? Your block moved. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll talk. Maybe I'll move up. Yes, I'll be posting it for my classes uh, within my Canvas site. But Elijah uh, is not in my class. He's in mine. No. Oh, I, yeah. No, I'm in uh, Batalo. Yeah, that's me, Elijah. <laughs> yeah, I was driving. I haven't, I haven't figured out how to pronounce the name. You got it right. You're fine. <laughs> Hey, I was wondering, um, I wanted to share a link that you probably know of it, with the CSU's Japanese American Digita Digitization Project. Mm -hmm. It's an archive out of CSU Dominguez Hills. Mm -hmm. And I will put the link to that in the chat for other, uh, for other people's reference. It's, it's, it's a really, I think, great ongoing project that is mm -hmm. saving the visual history in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah, I have. Um, I should. I have to re recommend um, Den Show, which I'll put in the chat. But it's okay. a, a nonprofit organization here in Seattle that has a huge compilation of oral history interviews. Oh, great! Um, as well as the uh, digitized papers, archives, photos of uh, Japanese Americans before, during, and after the incarceration. And they have a lot of great videos, um, educational tools, resources, things like that. Thank you. I will put that in. Okay. And then Elizabeth, you asked, uh, do you write different stories from the book? So kind of taking off maybe from your initial thoughts. Um, um, let's see, I, I guess, yeah, it, it depends on the book <laughs> for sure. Um, it really um, depends on how much research, um, what's going, what other kinds of projects I have going on. But you know, sometimes it can take years, sometimes less is the short answer. Okay. Any other questions? Do you call the Japanese incarcerated rather than Japanese internment? And I think you're breaking up a little bit. Oh, I asked. Um, I know it's generally called Japanese internment. Is there a reason why you call it Japanese incarceration? There is a very good reason. Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, so I used to call it internment along with everybody else for a really long time. Um, but historians and the, and the Japanese American community have come to call it the incarceration over the last 10 years or so, because internment technically and legally refers to the imprisonment of non-citizens. Right, and two thirds of those who were incarcerated during the war were American citizens. So incarceration is more accurate. Um, also, I think it is. It, it says something different, right? Internment can feel like a really soft word, kind of a, you know, euphemism. Like, oh, they were interned. Oh, yes, that's so. You know, it also gets confused with interred, which is means buried. So <laughs> you have to be careful about that. <laughs> but um, yeah, incarceration is more accurate. Um, and I think it brings a different kind of impact as well. So yes, everybody go, go say incarceration now, okay? <laughs> Tamiko, if some of these individuals that were incarcerated were Japanese Americans, why could they not own land? That, that just, if you're an American, you're an American. Well, <laughs> <laughs> unless you're not, right? And there are um, legal, things that prevent you from owning land, right? Um, so there were, um, I can't remember the actual law, um, but in Washington state specifically, um, 
not only were Japanese immigrants prevented from owning land because they were prevented from being citizens, right? They uh -huh. legally could not become citizens, um, but their kids were also prevented from owning land because um, of um, this um, senator that we had, Albert Johnson, who basically was able to pass this um, law that said that not only could the immigrants not own land, but their kids could not either. Um, this was definitely you know, uneven across the state and across mm -hmm. the country, right? So some folks um, like California, where my family's from, they were able to have land because they right. were um, American citizens and California didn't have that particular um, restriction. But yeah, yeah, this also contributes to why Tacoma, right, was so different after the war. If you don't own anything, you know, you have your yeah, belongings you don't in a basement. Have anything back, yeah. Yeah, right. exactly. but the ones that, like, I hear in um, the Los Angeles area, at least my dad used to tell me, some of them did own property, and, and I, yes, I yes. never did ask then, and I should have asked him before he died. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened to their property? That that's just not. It's not right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, my parents, I mean, my parents, my, uh, my grandparents were super poor. They were sharecroppers, so they didn't own anything mm -hmm. um, land-wise or house-wise. They did have a few belongings, um, but most of those were lost after the war. And uh, there's an interesting uh, comment from Casey. Can you see that one? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, went to Japan. Cool. Oh, great. It's a comment. Thank you. Get excited for the book. Thank you. We worked really hard on it. I hope folks are, we'll, we'll take it to heart. And you did tell us where we could purchase it, correct? Can you put that so in? So I did not, but um, at the easiest place I would say is bookshop.org, which, um, you know, helps support your favorite local independent bookstore. Um, and they send any, you know, if you, if you have a favorite independent bookstore, it's, you can order it through there as well. But bookshop.org is one of the easiest places where you can find it. Um, so look for Hereby Refuse, We Hereby Refuse, or you can look for my name and either of them should bring up um, the graphic novel. Okay, any more, um, Maria, read from the standpoint of the library, anything you'd like to? Um. I loved hearing about how much research has, you know, goes <laughs> into your, your works. And I guess I would ask, um, yeah. And also that you had a research assistant, somebody who's trained to do this research. Mm -hmm. And uh, were you able to use your local public libraries or the li were the libraries in Tacoma helpful? Yes. Um, or where you, where your, um, and especially uh, where the incarcerations were happening or are the libraries showing their local histories? Yes, so um, Tacoma Public Library, which is my uh, public library, um, has this fantastic collection of um, photos from the Richard Studio, which took photo like thousands and thousands and thousands of photos. Um, and they were, I think, hired by Japanese Americans to document events and things like that. And they were there the day that, uh, the two days that the Japanese Americans were evicted from Tacoma. So there are amazing photos in that collection of the train station, of the people saying goodbye on the trains and things like that. Um, so yeah, um, I use libraries all the time. <laughs> I could not do most, most of my work without them. Um, as far as for the graphic novel, I, mean, I used a combination of sources, right? So I had things from Densha, which I mentioned, um, the oral histories. Um, so we got one of the interviews with uh, Mitsuya Endel was from Cal State Fullerton, I believe, with uh, Art Hansen and his collection there. Um, we used uh, the University of Washington Library as well uh, quite a bit. And that's where I got some of the interlibrary things. Uh, we had to do some finagling to get the copies of the archives um, from, <laughs> from the um, Bancroft Library in Berkeley. Yes. Yeah. yes, just a ton of places. So we had yeah. to be really creative about where we looked. But if yeah. you do anything with you know the histories of communities of, of color, I think you have to be really creative about where you look for your sources. Yes, that's a great point. Um, and um, of course, and of copyright, you know, who, who when yeah. you go into an archive, it's, it's very, you have to be very careful about who owns what and getting mm -hmm. permission if you're going to use something, if it's for your own research or whatever. But if, you know, but that's a, a tricky subject too. But I think 
you're right. Um, for communities of color within within the United States, it, it is hard to find these collections. You know, they right. have not been supported. They have not been created. They have not been, you know, continued. And so, um, so thank you for sharing, you know, that aspect of it. And, and, but oh, they sure. are coming and, online. Yeah, so, absolutely. And, you know, like the way that the mainstream newspapers covered something, right, would have been different than how maybe yes. ethnic media might have covered it, right? So, you know, the Tacoma paper was were just terrible about the ways that they covered the eviction from Tacoma with Japanese Americans. There were all these like smiling, happy kids and <laughs> people just being like, oh, bye, it'll be great. Um, you know, it was it, it was a very different coverage, right? Than I think yes. how people were internally experiencing it. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we have just a couple more comments and then we'll yeah. probably need to. Uh... Yes. Yes, this is true. If they did not, so was it true that Japanese Americans who had farms in California had trouble with their farms being taken away while incarcerated? Yes, um, they were usually asked to dispose of their property before they left. Um, so um, it, those who managed to hold on to it might have had a caretaker, but the caretakers might might not have always been trustworthy, or they might not have stayed or been willing to stay. Um, so yeah, it, lots of lots of property loss for sure. And then let's see, uh, $20,000, yes. Yeah, man, messed up systems. <laughs> um, besides the $20,000 owed to Japanese Americans, was anything else given to them? Um, and that's about Native Americans and how systems all messed up. <laughs> yes, I mean, um, I'm happy to say that at long last, yet again, Japanese Americans are talking about, talking with the African American community about how um, reparations might be possible, right? Um, but yeah, anything else was, was anything else given to them? There was the establishment of a civil liberties public education fund um, uh, dedicated to creating, maintaining um, the stories, right, about incarceration. And so um, not individually, right, but sort of as a larger community, there was um, that aspect. They also received a um, written presidential apology um, by the time most of them received that first uh, that letter and the check that was around in the 19th, so like George Bush, I believe, is who was signing the presidential apology. So um, President Reagan signed the uh, Civil Liberties Act that gave um, the surviving folks $20,000 per person. Um, yeah, so definitely if you want to look up um, anything about that particular part of the story, look up. Um, Denshaw and find their core story videos. And they talk about the redress movement in a little detail in their, from their page. And then there's lots of resources about the redress movement. It's really important. Um, let's see, California history. California was a little different from the other states. I mean, yes and no. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they were, you know, one of the highest populations for sure of Japanese Americans on the West Coast. Um, but, yeah, it's interesting. The more I learn about camp history, honestly, the more I learn that there's just a lot more to learn. <laughs> um, you know, it's 100, you know, 20,000 people um, with 120,000 stories. And most of those are not known. Okay, so internment camp. So there were, uh, were there internment camps? So I'm going to call them assembly centers. And I think that's what, she, um, in this case, because assembly centers are the, um, the fun term, the government term for these temporary camps that were created um, before they were shipped to the um, more permanent concentration camps. Um, and I use concentration camp again, because that's a more accurate term, right? It's based on um, imprisonment based on uh, the, an aspect of somebody's identity. Um, so I'm not equating them with the Nazi death camps, but again, using the more correct technical term concentration camps. Um, there were assembly centers in uh, Oregon. What, there was one at, in Portland and then in Washington. Um, lots of folks went to um, Camp Harmony at the Washington State Fairgrounds in Puyallup. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think we're at our time and I we yeah. really appreciate it. Wonderful questions. Yeah, great uh, questions, everyone. Thank you. From uh, <laughs> all sides, library, writing, art. 
uh, we've got how we can order your book. If somebody wants to follow you, um, I know you have a Facebook page because you are doing other talks. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see. Yeah, here I'll put my personal web, uh, web address, which has an FAQ now, so you can see more. <laughs> Um, that's my personal website, which has more links to more of my writing um, stuff about um, some upcoming events, though I don't keep that up as well as I should. Um, and I am on Twitter if you want to message me there. But... If you want to download the chat, you're welcome to do so also uh, because it's got some, I'm going to download it in case something come, somebody asks me to uh, a question, I've got the chat saved. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Letitia, did you want to add anything before we leave? I just wanted to say thank you. This was thank wonderful. You. And I'm so oh, pleased so with the, the turnout. And so um, again, just thank you for taking the time to come out and um, share your story with our, our institution. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Letitia is our Dean of Humanities. So oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, any other things before we do sign off? We really appreciate this. This is so enlightening and wonderful. And I wish we were in the gallery and you could sit around and talk to us for the rest oh, of the Oh, I day. know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> someday we'll be open up and we can get you down here. And yeah. Uh, uh, I do want to make an announcement that next uh, Thursday at, uh, so April 8th at two o'clock, Edward had to take off but Edward Guyon will be doing a um, talk about interdisciplinary storytelling. He's a beautiful storyteller in his own right. And so he is combining images, his own voice, a narrated voice that's recorded and music. And he'll be showing us at least four of his short digital stories. Uh, a digital story is another form of narrative Edward uses beautiful photography. He's an award-winning um, actor, producer, director from Asia. Um, and uh, we're, we're honored to have him. He lives in the Bay Area. So he'll be, he was having a little internet connection trouble today. So I hope he does it next week, but he will be with us April 8th at eight o'clock if you can, or eighth, April 8th at two o'clock. Uh, there's a flyer that's been sent out. So hopefully uh, some of you can join us we're, we're taking the arts to the narrative, whether it's visual, music, film, or uh, written. So I thank you all for coming. If you have any other questions, you can stick around. I'll be here if you want anything um, for a few more minutes. And uh, hey, thanks so uh, much for having me. It was wonderful. Learned so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I will stop recording.